This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Joining us today for a cup of coffee to discuss Devil's Deal, the 11th episode in Season 1 of Star Wars The Bad Batch, our two returning guests to Coffee with Kenobi. First, we're going to bring in, it's been a while since he's been on, but when you hear the dulcet tones of his voice, you'll know it's the one and only Aaron Harris from Star Wars Reactions. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> How's everybody doing? It's good to be back. Thanks for having me, Dan. It's good to have you, man. Well, you're the number one Chopper fan besides me, so come on. This is an easy one. <laughs> this this was, is an, oh, this was a great show. <laughs> it was fun. And we just had uh, your your co-pilot, David Motters, on not too long ago, so we are we are uh, balancing the ship out. Um, but speaking of balance, we've got to have uh, the third person for our tricycle. Uh, I always like using that <laughs> metaphor because I always let it ambiguous who's driving the tricycle and who's in the... <laughs> it's kind of fun. Who's running in circles? Uh, we've got, uh, of course, Mr. Tom Gross. Well, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. As always, looking forward to discussing this episode of Bad Batch. Welcome, Aaron, uh, Aaron and Dan. Great to see you. Thank you. I, I thought you were going to, I thought it was going to be a pour over where you're going to welcome me to the show. I was getting really excited about yeah. that. <laughs> Hi, it's great to be here. I really like the hey. wallpaper. All right. So, this is one last week. We were doing this. I forgot to ask everybody for their initial thoughts and a letter grade. Oh. Aaron, do I even need to ask you what your letter grade is? Um, there is a grade high enough for me for this episode. <laughs> uh, All right, tell tell us tell us what you thought about it, and tell us. I'm guessing A plus. Is that right? Uh, I, I, the the show well, when we just recorded our our review on reaction Star Wars reactions last night and I actually told David it was an A plus 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 um but it it was a great episode I absolutely loved it 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 caught me off guard on so many levels that I actually had to watch it a second time because as soon as that little sensor popped up over the rock I lost my mind. So yes. <laughs> I hear you. It, it, uh, I, I, I lost all sense of reality after that. Um, but it was a great episode. It was well done. The animation was stunningly gorgeous. And uh, initially it just, like I said, it rocked my world in uh, so many ways um, just from the get go, from the, from the opening scene, really. So love it. Love it. Well, that, that is exactly what I expected. Uh, Tom, what about you? Your letter grade and overall thoughts on this one? I give it a solid A. Um, I loved this episode. Um, and I don't have a whole lot to say because uh, I'm sure we'll discuss it in detail later, except I will say this. I've been remodeling a room this week. And when you finish something off to complete the job, you caulk and you, you fill in all those <laughs> like cracks and everything around there. This, this episode is like the cock. To, no, that doesn't really work. This episode <laughs> was, was wonderful. It just, this is what I'll say about it. This show to me is a transitionary show. And it takes me from Clone Wars to Rebels. It just, mm -hmm. it, it, it's making a transition and I'll talk more about that as we go, but I really saw this as a transitionary show. So can't wait to discuss. Excellent. How about you, Dan? What's your grade? You know, this is actually a hard one for me to grade because on the one hand, of course, you know, like, like you guys, especially I know Aaron, how much you love rebels rebels is, I would put rebels above most of the, a lot of the star Wars movies. I think rebels is extraordinary. Uh, I love these characters seeing Hera and Chopper back mind blowing, but there are two challenges that I have with this episode. One, it's called the bad batch, but this is not a bad batch episode. I mean, you know, ostensibly it's called the bad batch, but they're not really a part of it at all. They're not even critical mm -hmm. to the story. I find that a little odd and the way that it ends is a cliffhanger, but it's not really a full ending. I think you can have a cliffhanger without an ending. That's just uh that's just a you know a there's a storytelling part of that that I'm not quite sure about but I reserve the right to modify that after I see what's coming next right so I'm going to sure. give it an A minus so hopefully it'll flesh out as we yeah. go up 
All right, so we start out the episode very similarly to what we did last week mm-hmm. uh, with uh, with some senators and some struggles. However, last week, uh, the senator, I can't think of his name. Let's see. I know I've got it written down Singh. somewhere. Uh, Singh. Senator Singh. Singh. Yes, yes. S-I-N-G. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, obviously. Yes. He uh, it was very clear that he did not want to be a part of the empire. He struggled with it for a very, very, very brief amount of time. And this one, we've got Senator Orrin Frita, who has been a pain ever since we met him in the prequels. That has not gone away in this episode. And then we we see the Sandulas. We see Cham Sandula, and we see Hera's mother, Elena. Elena is that how we pronounce it? It's E L E N I. It's Elena Sandula. Uh, it, it's strange because even when Rampart Elena. addresses her, he calls her Sandula. Yeah. Which yeah. I think is Which, interesting because it probably wouldn't surprise me if the Empire was sexist. I mean, hello. Although they have a lot of females that are um, in charge in, in various forms. But uh, the M- the Empire is, is always shown a unique blend of its own version of uh, discrimination, uh, you know, through mostly using humans in all of their things. Whereas, you know, here on, on, on this planet, we've got Chan, we've got Sindula, and and we've got... Twi'lex, right? Yep. So yep. it doesn't surprise me that the Empire would be uh, treating them the way that they are. Then we we, we re-encounter Cham. Now, Aaron, I know uh, Cham Sandula is not new to Star Wars. We, we've seen him in A New Dawn. We've seen him in other books, um, past, present, and um, post Return of the Jedi books. Mm-hmm. We've seen him a lot of times. We've certainly seen him in The Clone Wars and Rebels. But here we start to see but this man wasn't always ostensibly fighting and, and angry. We, we, we see that he's a very, he's conflicted, but he's, he's putting on quite a brave face. What do you make of Cham Sandula at the beginning of this episode? Because he certainly has, we have an understanding right away that this is called devil's deal for a reason. Oh, of course. It, Cham, Cham is a very unique uh, character. And he, he, every time we've seen him, he has been the warrior. He's been the general, the, the man out front defending Ryloth. And, you know, even the most hardened generals uh, out there, they do get exhausted. They get tired of the fight. They, they need a break. And Cham is at that in this episode, at the beginning of this episode, Cham is at that point. He needs a rest. The, the, the fight against the separatists are over. Ryloth is free uh, at that point. And he, he, he doesn't want to turn things over to the clones, but yet at the same point, he, he's too exhausted to fight it. So he, he, re- and he, tr- and it's not that he trusts Rampart. He trusts Hauser. You can, mm-hmm. he has, cause he, he was, he never really, you could tell he never really was putting much weight into what, uh, Rampart was saying, uh, or especially even Oren Frita. He definitely doesn't trust Oren Frita, but it was when Hauser stepped forward, he's the one that has his trust. And cause obviously they've, you can, to me, it was obvious they had a working relationship in the past at mm. some point along the way that we didn't get to see. So he, there's that trust there, and it's probably built in the in the battle lines of war, where they they trusted each other in the fight, in the defense of Ryloth. So he trusted Hauser to do what was best for Ryloth and to give him the break that he needed. So I think it's still the same man. It is just a exhausted form of the man that we saw in rebels that we would see in rebels or that we saw in clone wars. Right. I like that. An exhausted form of the man is a really good um, explanation. Uh, he, when he gets up to speak, cause one free Todd does, and it doesn't move the people, but jam does. And he, he basically says the clones fought with us for us. And I trust them. Let's lay down our weapons and focus on Ryloth's future. So Tom, you're, you're obviously a, a very well-read uh, guy and you know a lot about history. I feel like here with this, this idea of Ryloth throwing down their weapons for peace while there is a very casual, it's not an invasion, but it is an invasion. Um, there's a lot of real world parallels. And, and I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot. I know, I don't know that you were, you read your, your history book before the show tonight, but <laughs> I feel like the, the themes that are in this 
uh, are, are really fascinating. Step down the military presence. Let us help mm-hmm. you out. Um, to me, as a viewer, it seems very clear. Why would you let this happen? But why are they letting this happen? Well, I mean, you know, it, 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 it goes back to they're following a leader. A lot of the things Aaron said is what led the people to, to believe this. And I think one thing that hasn't been said about Sham is what a diplomat mm-hmm. he is. Mm-hmm. Um, both he and uh, his wife, they, to keep the peace in the room with Rampart, you know, Rampart questions them. Why would you, what is your, what is your feeling of, of this? And she says, I'll do what's best for Ryloth. And then um, Sham puts puts forth the message of of peace, and so you know hi- historically it's it is the exhaustion of of war that causes people to want to do this, um, but it generally comes from you know a, 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 some type of a leadership position that is asking them, telling them that this is what we want. This is what, and I love the moment when when. Uh, Cham says, this is what we fought for, mm-hmm. you know, because how do you deny that? You know, we have been fighting. We've been fighting for a long time and we wanted peace. Nobody's fighting now. So I guess it's time. And you could, you could also tell that the crowd had, had, you know, zero confidence in the Senator and it goes back to, you know, throughout the Clone Wars, he, and, and and Cham calls it out. He he did nothing for Ryloth. He did everything for his own self power and interest. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, um, I don't know that I answered the historical aspect, but you know, it, it is it is the following of a good leader that people do this. So I guess I'll leave it with that. No, I mean it's a tough one. I mean, you know, I, I my knowledge of World War II is certainly rusty. But I, but I see I know that just from what my fleeting recollections I I know that there's some similarities there to a lot of conflicts throughout world history, undoubtedly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've got we've got Cham and his wife. We've got Gobi Glee, who is he is the uncle of a future pilot in the rebellion. Uh, but I, do they is it is Gobi Cham's brother? Is that what they say? I, you know, I don't I, think they actually said they address that. I don't There's recall a, that. I don't recall it. I don't either, but I know he's the, he's he's Hera's uncle. Speaking of Hera, so yeah. when I first saw they were on Ryloth, I mean, naturally, Aaron, you you go to oh please, please let it happen. But I don't know about you, but I put my brain in stasis mode, where I thought I know <laughs> I'm going to be disappointed if I don't see Hera, so I'm going to just hold my breath and hope that we at least hear about her or something. Or something. And then, Aaron, describe what happened. <laughs> but I'm more important in hearing how you reacted and was there, was there any arrests made because of a sound ordinance in your small community? Well, I, I would be more worried about the waking up of my household because I yes. watched it at like 6.30 in the morning <laughs> while everybody was still sleeping and the only people up were my two dogs, Ahsoka and Obi-Wan. Um, Perfect. <laughs> They, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it, it was interesting because the episode started, I, I, I recognized immediately we were on Ryloth and I was I'm like, oh, sweet. I never thought I'd be back here. And then we get Cham. I'm like, oh, that's sweet. That's, we got Cham. And all of a sudden I'm like, man, if Cham, Tara should be alive at this point. And then her mother, and I'm like, oh my goodness, <laughs> this is great. Then they say her name and I'm like, oh, oh. We could get we're we're going to see Hera in this. We're actually we we may actually see Hera in this. And then it then it then the light bulb went off. If we see Hera, we're going to see Chopper because she would have had him by now because <laughs> the Clone Wars are over. Oh my gosh, I'm going to see Chopper, and, and I just literally went from <sighs> kicked back in the recliner with my feet up to sitting on the edge of the couch, pacing the floor waiting on it and then when when that scene changed and we got the rocks and everything and we see that little sensor bud popped up oh man i woke up the entire house when i squealed so loud i jumped i i scared the dogs they started barking it was un, it was an ungodly noise that came that emerged from the living room that that day and um 
then seeing that astromech and all of his orange glory was was a highlight of my day i still haven't gotten over <laughs> <laughs> tom what about you yeah you know what very similar um i i i'll just cut to the chase i cheered when when that popped up and i heard her say chopper i was excited for the part for the pair for the two of them Mm -hmm. and i just i was like yes yeah and i (laughs) clapped and i cheered and thank goodness my wife had her her headsets in because she was working out so i was all alone i got to be as loud as i wanted when i cheered i felt perfectly comfortable doing that and i just thought i just yeah and then you know it just and it snaps you back to a time so what time? I don't know. You know, somewhere in, in Rebels, but it snaps you back and Chopper twirls his head and rawr, 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 and his grunchiness, grunch, grouchiness and his little arm comes out on top of his head and does all the crazy things. And, and just the joy. It was just joyous to uh, see that. What about you, Dan? Did, did you have a similar reaction or I know you were uh, reserved in, in, in bef- like reserved it at, at, at the, at the moment. <laughs> I was, I was, you know, I was reserved similar to what I was like when I saw Luke and Mandalorian, you know, that kind of reserved. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I didn't, it didn't reach those heights, but it reached some heights. So when, when I saw yeah. this in duels, I told you how I felt. And then the little, the little dish pops up in that sand dune because before that we hear Hera has other interests. I'm like, they're saying Hera. And before I have a chance to even finish my statement, Mm -hmm. and we see the little dish pop up (laughs) and then we hear Hera say so I I I went like yes I pumped my fist like Jordan just made a a killer basket in the fourth quarter and I looked at Mace I go Chopper's here Hera's here Chopper and Hera here and we high-fived I was so happy and then my breath gets taken away because of the beauty of of flying Yes. This exquisite yes. metaphor of flying. She puts her hand up, kind of looks at the sky, and there's a bird. And it's just, again, there are three birds flying yep. across. And I was so moved by the beauty of it. Uh, and as a side note, I when I heard Hera, I knew it was Hera. And I knew that it had the soul of Hera. But it didn't sound like Vanessa. But it was Vanessa Marshall. And speaking yeah. of that, uh, recently I was very fortunate to be a part of of a press event, a virtual press event, where I got to speak with Vanessa Marshall and ask her a couple of questions. So I'm going to play that for you. Well, hello, Vanessa. Good to see you again. Hi. So good to see you. <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm I'm so excited for this. Your voice work is always outstanding. But you've taken it to another level here with a younger version of Hera than you portrayed in Star Wars Rebels. If you could, please talk about your process and direction for bringing Hera to life for the Bad Batch. Uh, well, thank you for asking. I, I got the email um, asking if I would be interested in doing the job. I said, yes, we set a date. I got the script. Uh, I loved it. I had no idea who Omega was, but I looked forward to having an imaginary conversation with her <laughs> um, because this was recorded in the pandemic. And uh, so I was by myself in my recording booth. And uh, I will say parenthetically that that as a huge Bad Batch fan who's fallen in love with Omega to finally understand exactly who I was talking to, totally fangirl flail. Um, Okay, then we consider her her age and sort of the the pitch of her voice and of course the accent because this is her hometown and uh, she gets back to her hometown accent with charm as we see later in Rebels, but um, yeah, so it was it was interesting to discover exactly how young, exactly how much of the accent, and uh, I rehearsed it many different ways, um, and then brought all of that to the recording session and trusted that wherever they directed me, I would follow, and we found her together. And it, when combined with the animation, I was blown away, and I could not believe I was talking to Omega. Just couldn't believe it. <laughs> Thank you. You're a rock star. Oh, you are. It's so good to see you. <laughs> you too. Wonderful. Well, Vanessa, one of the best things about Devil's Deal was, of course, the introduction, reintroduction of Hera. But talk about the beautiful metaphor of flying in this episode and what we learn about Hera through it. Yes. Well, uh, as I've said, my dad is a pilot and I've flown with him before. And, um, you know, it's interesting. My dad, he worked at NBC for many years as a news reporter. And uh, when he retired, 
he said, you know, I was in the Air Force, but I only worked for the radio station there. I never got to fly a plane. And I dared him to learn how to fly. I did not expect him to not only learn how to fly, but learn how to fly an open cockpit biplane um, and do hammerhead maneuvers over Kern County. I mean, my dad is out of control. <laughs> and, uh, but um, having said all that, equally, there is a spiritual element to it that he always taught me that it's important to get perspective uh, on the earth below and that there's nothing like flight to help you uh, really see things as they are. And um, so when she says that specs are only half of it, that flying is about the feeling um, and that ultimately it helps her feel free. For a teenage girl to understand that to me spoke volumes of exactly why she had the capacity to become a really great pilot. Um, and uh, when I did Wings of the Master, I dedicated that episode to my father yeah. and uh, it meant so much to me. And in turn, it meant a lot to him because he knew that, that all of those words, uh, once again, they nailed it. Um, that is uh, the value of flight for many pilots is, is that sort of feeling of freedom. And um, I'm grateful that they echoed exactly what she said in Wings of the Master that she used to look up to the sky and feel free um, when we, you know, got to see that, uh, here in Bad Batch, it was just, it was just beautiful. And I, I love that she was having a conversation with another female character. For me, um, these girls imagining their lives in, in ways that perhaps, you know, they don't often, uh, consider in terms of, uh, you know, Hera is, you know, you need to be a good girl and stay on the ground or whatever it is you know, that they have the capacity to realize their dreams. I think it's really important to see that and that they support each other in that. And, and uh, there, there were no haters. There was no hater energy. You know, like, they're like, oh, you get to live on a flight. You get to live on a ship. Oh, I've always wanted to do that, you know, or whatever it is. And uh, that they could dream together. I, I think that that's really, um, really powerful. And, and I'm grateful that they model that for other young girls or for humans in general. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Inspirational, yeah. beautiful, and it passes the Bechtel test. There you have it. <laughs> yes. And for my money, Hera is still the best pilot in the Star Wars galaxy, past, present, or future. Wow. Okay. Woo. That's high <laughs> praise. Thank you, sir. <laughs> you bet. Thank you. <laughs> so as you can, as you just heard, I asked her about changing her voice and the style for the character. And I also asked her about the metaphor of flying. Of course, Vanessa is great. Um, Tom, have you met Vanessa before? I have not. You have not. Well, hopefully we can change that at, at the next celebration. Aaron, I know yeah. you have, yes. and I know how much Vanessa means to you. Do you want to tell that, share that story with us really quickly before we continue with the episode? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've met her, uh, Vanessa on several. <laughs> Hera. Uh, she is Hera, you know, <laughs> yes. I, I met yes. Vanessa several times uh, actually, but the first time I met her, uh, was actually before Rebels even began airing. It, they hadn't even premiered yet. Uh, it was Star Wars weekends, and they were doing, they were hyping the show. And each week they had a member of the ca of the Ghost Crew there, mine, except for Freddie Prince. And she was one of the ones that was there. And the day I met her, she had recorded with you, Dan, the day before. <laughs> and uh, you told her I was coming because at the time I was covering Star Wars Weekends for Coffee with Kenobi. And when we got up to the booth to see her, and because it was a new show, nobody knew who they were. So there was like literally nobody at their booths. Um, so I got up, I was like third in line out of three to see her. And when I got up there, she saw the Coffee with Kenobi shirt and she immediately knew who I was. And called me by my name. <laughs> Hi, Aaron. You're Aaron, right? And I'm like, yes. And she came out from around the table, gave me the biggest hug I'd ever had. And we just <laughs> we just stood there and we talked for a good 50, because there was nobody behind me. We talked for about 15, 20 minutes uh, during her autograph time. And it was just awesome. And since then, every time I've seen her, she has talked to me uh, and given me, uh, it called me by name. Every time she sees me, she knows who I am. And it, it goes back to that moment. And it was, oh, it was, it was fantastic. I love it. I love that you got that experience and she's wonderful. That she's cool. She's great. Her performance here is outstanding. 
Uh, the metaphor of flying, do you guys want to talk about that? To me, it, it just ec- very much echoes, of course, this wonderful poetic dramatic irony of what she's going to become. Uh, later in the episode, she talks about what it means to her, why it, her she has such a passion for flying. But Tom, do you want to talk about that at all? Anything stand out to you? Well, just it just takes me to the idea of you know hope and freedom, mm-hmm. you know that 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 idea. And you know, she said you know later in the episode when she's having a wonderful conversation with her dad, you know, his first question: Do you still dream of flying? And and it's like it's like almost like saying: Do you still dream of getting out of here, or do you still dream of of traveling? Or you know, it's it just it has so much of that in there. And I could have swore, and I, I never remember the name of the song, and we've talked about this before when luke's standing looking at the twin sons what's the what's that theme what's that song called is it the theme of the twin sons or something mm. i can't it? remember the force is, theme but but, it, but 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 when hera goes to lay down on the rocks i swear there are notes of that in this of that of that mm. tune in mm. in the music and immediately i thought of you know, Luke always dreaming, Luke always looking off to the horizon and there's Hera. She just does it differently because she wants to fly. He wants to escape. She wants to fly. It does. It does sound like that. It does very much sound like that. All right. So uh, suddenly Char goes, uh-uh, because uh, clones appear. I think it's <laughs> fascinating in this episode. because We haven't even talked. I mean, Aaron, you mentioned the name Hauser. We haven't talked about Hauser too much so far. But besides Hauser, whenever we see clones, they always have their buckets on. They always have their helmets on. But Hauser mm-hmm. is different. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aaron, what do you make of Hauser? Yeah, Hauser obviously is more of the type of clone we are used to seeing from the Clone Wars. He reminds me more of a Rex, an Echo, and somebody like that that we see. And he is he's he's very warm he's kind he's caring he's compassionate and we see that when he find when the, his clones grab Hera and chopper in that quote unquote restricted area where she's you know just watching the sky and and, and it, dreaming of flying and he instead of you know he takes her back to the the Sindula homestead which was awesome to see again uh, but and he's like you know we found her in a restricted area just don't make sure it doesn't happen again we're not going to mm-hmm do anything and you could tell there's uh there's there's compassion he he knows understands she's a kid (laughs) she wasn't meaning to do anything wrong um and he he has a warmth to him that i would that i'm used to seeing from rex uh and i loved that it was the type of clone i'm used to seeing uh from from star wars well i also love the fact that he he shows a choice like he shows Mm -hmm free will yeah. he shows that he's got scruples and morals and he's uncomfortable in fact everybody in this episode besides Hera, really are, are, are pretty torn with what they're doing Hera feels like it's not that complicated <laughs> i'm doing something because it's the right thing to do like she doesn't even yep. she doesn't have to think twice about it there's such inner strength in that which i absolutely love by the way that's the track of that song is binary sunset ah i knew it had yeah. something yeah, but okay. Yeah. Um, so I have a, I have a question regarding that, if I could. Um, you know it, it, what you said, Aaron, about Hauser. It, it's almost like these these clones that ha- often have their uh, helmets off and are speaking to generals or commanders. They're under like the permanent uh, "May I speak freely." Uh, uh, clause mm-hmm. because they do, you know, and that's, and that's what I sense from Hauser is, is he, is he was willing, he was able to speak freely with Cham without any sort of um, um, worry of like repercussion or something like that. But the question I wanted to ask is, and, and maybe there's a re- you guys probably have a much better recollection of this and it, but it's been on my mind since we've met Hauser. Were there any Jedi on Ryloth? at during order 66 that we are aware of because i'm wondering if he ex- obviously he experienced order 66 in his head but did he have to execute it and does that change how he treats people like cham sindula i mean he would have no you know the the clones would have no no ill feeling towards someone like cham sindula unless they had mm-hmm. supported or tried to harbor jedi and so that is that why Hauser feels different? 
Well, Jam had said, you know, we fought with them. We've died with them. So mm -hmm. there is no, the clones very much respect him. But, you know, the ones that, and I'm not saying that Hauser doesn't have a chip, but he's not acting like someone that has a chip. And as far as whether any Jedi on Ryloth, I mean, it stands the reason that there would be, but we don't really have any evidence of that. Okay. Yeah. Or knowledge that I that I am immediately aware of. Uh, yeah. We can certainly look at that a little bit further. Um, then um, Uncle Glee, Gobi Glee, and uh, Hera's mom. Oh, I have the worst time pronouncing her name. Eleni. What? How do we pronounce it? I was calling her El Eleni. Eleni. Eleni sounds better than what I was saying. Eleni. Yeah. That's what. Yeah, that's we're going to go. We're that's gonna what go David and that. I were calling her. All right, that's going to be the official one for the rest of the show and until the way you learn otherwise. <laughs> so Ellen and I, yeah, she she and, uh, and Glee were talking about basically, you know, uh, well, they're, they're scheming, right? But but it's unclear. Hera is brought back and Hauser, in a super cool manner, which again shows, well, he's way different. He says, you know, I, I got, I'm going to overlook this this time, but, you, you know, there's a lot of heat out there. Things are really bad. Things are really yeah. tense. So please don't let this happen. And she was in a restricted zone. And then uh, Glee's like, well, how can it be a restricted zone if there's nothing to hide? Mm -hmm. And he doesn't say this, but this is their planet. It's their yeah. home. Yeah. Why should yeah. they anything be off limits to them that's not designated by them? Yep. Then there's this great character moment, Aaron, uh, where um, Hera's mom says, uh, mentioned something about the refinery. And Hera says, wait, how did you know it was the refinery? And then she just smiles. Just well, tell me what you saw. I love that moment, Aaron. I'm I'm sure you you really enjoyed that. Well, you see where Hera gets some of her spunk from. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and that was one thing I, I loved about this episode, especially getting to meet her mom, who we never got to see before, and we only heard about, is how much her, she is like Hera mm -hmm. uh, from from Rebels. And there was there was even a the scene at the beginning of the of the episode where rampart mentions it's a shame your daughter couldn't be here and as he walks away she turns and gives him a look and when she gives him that look i'm like dude that's Hera. Uh -huh. <laughs> like that's a Hera look i've seen her give yes. that to canaan so many times <laughs> but so yeah it is there's so much so much alike and you can definitely tell where she gets uh a lot of her her confidence and her her tenacity i would say yeah definitely um so then um goby and cham debate the imperials are up to something you just don't want to see it tom why is cham so reluctant to look at what's in front of him i think it goes back to his his want for peace his <laughs> looking out for his people um you know they let's let's just i think he has a little bit of hope also that maybe this isn't what it looks like um and uh you know i when you talk about history and i don't uh i'm well, yeah, I mean, when you talk about history, there's so many times in history where people say, why didn't they do something? Why didn't they, you know, this or that? And it's because they, you know, many reasons that it couldn't possibly happen or they're tired of it. And so they just allowed it to happen or they just didn't think the threat could possibly be as bad as it is. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure somewhere in there, Cham, Cham while he had an ill sense because of what they've just gone through with the clone wars, he was willing to give it, give it a go. Yep. I think so too. Yeah. And there also there's, he has good intentions. Like he, he believes like we've been fighting for so long. It's okay to be a piece of, it's okay not to always have conflict. Like some people yeah. in real life, as well as in a fiction world, have a hard time not having conflict. And sometimes yeah. they will create conflict, but Cham is not creating conflict. This is something that's uh. actually a real problem. Uh, but then, um, Hera and Cham have this great conversation, Aaron, and I want to ask both of you this, but Aaron, let's start with you. You both have daughters. I have three boys, but I feel like the relationship between a father and his daughter is something that I can understand because I don't have a daughter. Cham does. You both do. Mm -hmm. Hera says, I just want to know why you won't trust me. And this could be a very tense, uh, combative conversation. But it's not. It's not. Talk no. about 
the struggle here and how Cham handles it, Aaron. Why don't we start with you? Yeah. Yeah, this was a great scene, and I, I loved it that they put it in um, because we've been seeing these father-daughter type moments throughout the series between Hunter and Omega, and to now we're seeing it from a different perspective. Now we're seeing Cham and Hera, and it is there. There's a you know, like I said, I got two daughters myself, and as a matter of fact, my my oldest today is her birthday so we, we've, we've been celebrating all day um and it's one of those things where you're protect cham is you know he wants what's best for her he wants but he has seen what's out there you know she's like why don't you trust me like like uncle goby does and he knows what's out there he has fought side by side with goby he understands what's at the end of the path that Gobi is traveling and he doesn't want that. I mean, there, we, we always want the best path for our daughter and it's, or in our children, whether it's, whether it's a daughter or whether it's a son and Cham wants that for, for Hera. He doesn't want her to grow up in the same path that he had to go fight. He doesn't want her to be at war. He doesn't want her to be in an oppressed Ryloth uh, in in the trenches all the time. She ends up being in the trenches um, down the road. But, you know, that's a choice she makes. But he wants to set her on a right path. And he he feels, and honestly, and I think a lot of his hope, uh, like Tom mentioned, his hope for peace is because he wants Hera to have that peace. He wants her to have that safe home, that safe environment. And he wants, he wants his, he probably, he really probably wants his family and, and to take care of them. And he knows he, he's hoping for the best, but I think in the back of his mind, he knows there's something going on and I just don't want to face it. You know, the denial is not just a river in Egypt and he's, he's not, he's denying what he's seeing happen. Right. Mm-hmm. Very well said. And I yeah. might add parenthetically, the denial is also a bad guys in the high Republic as well. Yes. He is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, Tom, what about from your perspective? I, I really yeah. like how Cham handles this. I do too. And, uh, I, and Aaron, I saw the same thing in, in watching this little scene. I thought, I thought how appropriate, I mean, how appropriate, how appropriate the scene is in any episode of any mm-hmm. Star Wars show, but especially in the title of the Bad Batch, because we are seeing an actual father and daughter interaction relationship where all along we've been seeing this adopted, uh, you know, unofficial father daughter uh, yeah. relationship. And so I thought this was a nice a really nice piece because we know the characters also there's, so we have background knowledge as well, but, uh, but I love the way he starts off with, you know, ask, making the connection with her. Do you, are you, do you still dream of flying and, and goes there? And then she says that really, she says a really hurtful thing. And she says, Gobi trusts me. You don't trust me. I mean, it doesn't say exactly that way, but that's what she means. And it's, and it's really pointed. And I thought, man, that's that's a tough one as a father to swallow when your daughter tells you, you don't trust me. But mm-hmm. he doesn't take that. He takes the high road on this one, which I think is is really says a lot about him. And it also is kind of a micro micro examination of what we're looking at on the on the bigger screen. And that is he is not willing to he's willing to take the peaceful side of the empire and his planet and try to take the high road with peace. Here he does the same thing with his daughter. Rather than get into a bickering contest of whether I tr- whether I trust you or not, he he laughs and he says um and he says, "Oh boy, I like that fiery spirit." And he turns it back yes. on her in such a positive way. Mm-hmm. And he turns her and he looks at her and he says, "You remind me so much of myself." 
And I just love the way that he took that conflict and turned it into, and then it was the lesson that you just talked about, Aaron, where I don't want you to see the things that I've seen. I'll never have, a, I hope, I, keep my, I, I guess I should keep my fingers crossed and say, I hope I never have to have a conversation like that with my daughter that holds so much weight. But I've had those conversations where I've been accused of something of, you know, whatever, and, and I've had to choose. Okay, on this on the dime, on the nickel here, which direction am I gonna go? Am I gonna fight this or am I gonna try to turn it? And it's a hard thing to do. And he does it with such grace. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful moment. It's such a cool what we're seeing the last two years, we're seeing some great examples in Star Wars and parenting. Yes. And we can't have all we can't have, we haven't said that for a long time, really. Yeah. Not like this. He turns mm-hmm. it, he he doesn't dismiss her feelings. But he also doesn't give them a lot of dramatic weight either because he just smiles and says, I yeah. love you. I want to keep you safe. He says that without saying it. And he smiles and she seems frustrated, but not with him. Seems frustrated mm-hmm. with the situation. It's really wonderful and healthy. True. Great example of conflict that I absolutely love. Uh, and then, of course, Admiral Rampart shows up. And that is not a great example of conflict. That's a great example of manipulation. We're going to talk about that after the break. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. With travel beginning to open up and Walt Disney World and Disneyland reaching full capacity, this is the time to book your Disney World vacation with MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. Their signature service and expert advice will help clients maximize their vacation time and dollar. I use Becky Mencken and MEI's incredible services all the time, both for family and for travel for the show because of their no cost, no obligation quote when you use the service. Plus, they proactively adjust the booking if the rate goes down. Literally, I will wake up one morning and I'll get an email from MEI saying that the price went down and I will get a refund sent to my credit card right away. I don't have to do anything. They help your family enjoy everything Galaxy's Edge and the Disney theme parks and the cruise lines have to offer. Can help you plan every detail and always share invaluable tips. That's for Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or other cruise lines. It doesn't have to be Disney-related. They literally can help you plan a vacation anywhere on the planet. Be sure to go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel and sign up for a free no-obligation quote to any of the Disney theme parks on the planet or any vacation that you have in mind. You'll have the best vacation possible and help out me and Coffee with Kenobi in the process. We are back, and we we discover that there is a quick little mission that is a secret mission, naturally, and that's the best kind of mission in Star Wars, isn't it? Uh, secret <laughs> mission. A lot of the exciting <laughs> things happen. But Hera's uncle uses he, he kind of manipulates Hera to trick her into coming because he's oh, I'm going to let you fly. First of all, the ship that that her uncle Glee has is so cool and unique. Mm-hmm. But how do you feel about how he gets her on the ship and not to mention the fact that he wants her to come along? Why does he want to bring a child? Why are we constantly putting children in peril in star Wars? Why is that happening? <laughs> Aaron, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's been something I've been yelling about all, all the, the Grogu, whole season. For example. Yeah. Oh, well, not even Grogu. I mean, Grogu <laughs> had his own thing, there, but especially Hunter with Omega. I've been yelling that all season. Why are you taking these kid, this kid into a dangerous situation um, if you're wanting to protect her? Um, but yeah, he, he was very, he, he manipulated her. He knew exactly what card to play. And, you know, he's, he's the cool uncle <laughs> is essentially what the role he's playing in the story. He's, he's the cool uncle. And he knows how to, you know, there's always that uncle. Like my, my wife tells the story when her brother, brother and sister were being christened. Her uncle leaned over to her and said, you want to skip this and go get tacos? And they left and went and got tacos. So, yeah, he's oh. that, he is that cool uncle. Uh, and, and that's what Gobi's, the role Gobi's filling in this. So he knows what Hera wants. He knows what Hera likes. And he knows what Cham will not let her do. He knows Cham is not going to let her fly anytime soon. So, you know what? I was going to let you fly. You should have come. You know? And it's also tying, it also gets, lets her fly, gets him to go with her. And it keeps her from being free to, if somebody asks where he is for her to say, oh, he went on 
supply run. <laughs> it right. it mm. ties up a, a ties up a loose end. So I, I think he did that for multiple reasons, but mainly just to make sure there was nobody left behind that sure. could say he left. And I and I think in these very unusual circumstances, in his mind, he's probably keeping her safe and giving her prepared, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's still a war going on, even though they're you know the empire wants you to pretend like there isn't, but they've created yep. their own war that they're affording. They're just taking it to a different level. Exactly. So that, that I think that's I think it's unfortunately, as you mentioned earlier, Tom, you hope not to be put in these situations uh, with your family. But but in this, it's called Star Wars, so it's going to happen. Right. It's going to okay. happen. Um. So then uh, I wrote it down. We finally see a, 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 a shuttle, a modified Omicron attack shuttle with <laughs> the Bad Batch. It takes 13 minutes and seven seconds yep. for, the, mm-hmm. for the guys, uh, the titular characters of this show, to actually show up. I mentioned this at the top as far as something that um, was challenging for me. Not problematic, but challenging. Uh, Tom, how do you mm-hmm. feel about this? That it took 13 minutes and seven seconds, and that they're hardly in the episode at all. I was, I mean, obviously that it was, it was a initial shock. Shock is kind of a strong word, but it was surprising that this is the route and this is the direction and, and point of view that they decided to take on this episode. Um, but it makes a lot of sense to me, and I know a lot of people have been uh, critical of it, and rightfully so. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, mm-hmm. um, but I thought it made a lot of sense, and I think it's what helps create that, as I mentioned in the opening that sort of tipping point between the two big stories that we have. And it almost makes the Bad Batch as a transitional story between the the Clone Wars and the Age of the Empire. And this one is the one that does that for me. And uh, and so I, I'm sure we're not done with this conversation with the Bad Batch. So I'll, I'll save, I have a few more comments to make about it, but that's where I stood with it. I, I'm, I'm good with it. I was surprised and, and it was, but you know what, when they came, when that shuttle showed up, I was kind of like, yay, there they are. I felt almost the same way about them showing up as I did about Chopper, just, you know, volume four <laughs> rather than volume 12. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. Uh, I mean, to me, it's cool to see. My favorite thing about it um, is that Omega and Hera chat, yes. right? That, that they meet, that they converse. Uh, they have this wonderful conversation. And Aaron, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on the conversation between the two of them. Oh, this was a great scene. As when they finally showed up, I was I was thinking it's about time. Um, and it was a great scene for you know the bad batch only being in it in their own show for you know 90 seconds um but it was very unique to see these two kids get together and just immediately hit it hit it off and it wasn't a because she just sits on the on the at the top of the walkway of the ship omega does and Hera walks up she's like hey what kind of ship is this and and can I take a look around? And she, of course, Omega gets permission from Hunter and, and then just throws out the random line, no funny business. And Harris like, <laughs> what funny business? <laughs> and and then they go in and they start talking and she's telling, she's telling Omega or they're talking about the controls and everything. And then Hera just begins opening up about flying. And he's like, you know, it's not all technical skill. There's feels to it. There's feeling. And, and it was just a very moving and, and emotional moment. Uh, Cause to see how passionate Hera was about flying again uh, for the second time in the episode and Omega to just feed into that. Uh, it really, you know, you, you can put a bunch of kids in a room and kids are going to bond. Uh, and that's, it's the uniqueness and the innocence of, of, of youth is children are going to talk to each other and get to know each other and have fun no matter what walk of life they come from. And we, this was a perfect example of that. Yeah. A, a beautiful exchange of ideas. And, and, and since you're honest, I love the openness that Omega shows of, Hey, you know, this is usually a gun turret, but you know, when someone's not blasting at us, this is where I sleep. This is my yep. room. This is my home. Like she's taking her into her home. You know, a a, a female character of a the similar age, um, and they bond, and then she talks very openly and honestly about 
what why she wants to fly, why she wants to escape, and it passes what is called the Bechtel test. Are, are either of you familiar with the Bechtel test? No. So the Bechtel test is a way to uh, measure uh, the representation of women in fiction, and there are three things that have to happen. There have to be at least two female characters. They have to speak to each other, and they have to when they do speak to each other, it has to be about something other than a male love interest. And surprisingly, it's actually a pretty rare thing to actually happen in a story. <laughs> now, in recent years, um, we've become much more aware of how we tell our stories, and that's getting much, much better. But I think that's a very powerful moment that I couldn't let pass as a, as a teacher of literature. I think it's very significant and very, very cool. Um, so they leave, uh, they get the weapons from the bad batch who don't show up again. And then when they return, Hera is arrested and her uncle is arrested. And this is when Cham suddenly isn't going to hesitate anymore. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I want to show is talk about, and I should, I meant to ask you this time. Hera says the instruments, uh, uh, no, Hera says the instruments, no, wait, it's Omega. It's Omega who says the instruments help guide you, but you plot your course. You're free. And then she talks about the fact that flying is about a feeling. And then <laughs> I knew you I love knew. this. Yeah. <laughs> Omega said, and then, and then Texas, what feeling? How much did you love that? <laughs> that was, that might've been the line of the, of the episode for me, because when she says that I, I turned and I said to my daughter, I, who Kaylee was watching. Well, I guess Kayla wasn't watching me the first time, but I turned to her and I said, what's he going to say? What's he going to say? And she, and she goes, I have no idea. And I said, he's not going to get the feeling. part. <laughs> I, just, I thought that was so like, I mean, it was so stereotypical of tech that that's how he would see it. But, right. uh, but, but I, can I just say one quick thing about that conversation between Hera and Omega? Please. Yeah, please. It, it, I, it, I almost got emotional. Like I had that, like that, mm-hmm. like choking up feeling like right mm-hmm. before you just have this like happiness of like crying. Yes. Um, it has been a pretty emotional week for us. Uh, but, um, but all season it, it's been about who is, who is Omega learning from? And she's picking up bits and pieces from Sid, from Tech, from uh, Echo, from Hunter, from uh, you know, from everybody, even um, even Fennec Shand. You know, she's learning. And then when she sits down and they start talking about flying and they're sharing information back and forth, it I, like the emotion came from here is this here is this girl in Hera who we come to absolutely love. Mm. And she's she's teaching Omega, who we have now come to love. Yeah. It, she's teaching her. And it just, I don't know, there was something about that moment that just, I got a little bit choked up. And I just found it to be absolutely 100% precious. It's almost like so, a reverse anyway. passing of the torch in a way. It's yeah. a very, a very yeah. unique, what a, what a wonderful uh, storytelling uh, trope to, to utilize here. But in, but in, yeah. in an unconventional way. I, lo- I love that. I love that so much. Uh, so good, good job. So they go back to Ryloth, and for some reason, Crosshair blasts their ship. I don't know why he couldn't have waited to arrest them after they land. Um, so I'm still not quite sure why he did. Do either of you have any idea why? Well, probably so they didn't get back to the compound. The yeah, their ship was in a was probably in a compound, which they knew where it was. But the probably the reason they had that stormed it is because they wanted. Uh, it was probably there were probably security proceed place things in oh, place true so better it's to easier to trap. shoot them and, and take them down than to walk into a secured uh rebel base right that makes sense that makes sense. i went i just went back to his to episode two or three when he sent to Sagarera's camp and just kill them all yeah I, there's no like to to crosshair nothing's it's it's collateral damage. Just, Even with that just, massive scar right where you think his chip is, which is just hmm, what well, so odd. Um, I can't wait to see what happens with Crosshair. I think we all feel some way. Then Hauser steps up um, and he says, "Sir, she's only a child." When they accuse yeah. Hera of treason. Mm-hmm. Now, if you were under the spell of Order sixty six, you're not going to question the Empire. No, I I don't think. Uh, but but let's I know we're running out of time here, so let, let's talk about Chams showing up in his epic heroics. Aaron, uh, we'll start with you on that. 
Oh, Chan did exactly what I expected any father would do when his kid's in trouble. He's going to show up and fight for him. And that's exactly what he did. Even though he wanted to avoid a fight all through the show, he stood up and fought. And when he got there, he fought valiantly and the rescue was done. And then he went and he knew who to blame. He blamed Orrin Frita and he actually held the blaster to his head. He was going to pull the trigger that he had been wanting to pull for so many years and just get this thorn in his side done with. And it was his wife who stopped him. He's like, you know, not this way. He'll get what's coming to him, but not this way. Um, Harris safe. They sent her off with chopper. Yeah, anywhere you go with chopper's got to be safe. So, you know, he's, she's off with chopper safe and sound, but you know, it's just not, he is just so fired up at this point because they put, his daughter in danger. They shot at his daughter. They took her into custody and he knows it's, it's free toss or in free toss fault. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, he says your green self-interest, you've always put that above Ryloth. It's basically as long as I've known yeah. you. Um, and uh, you know, he's even like the, 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 the embodiment of gluttony and sloth and, uh, he's just, a, he's a repulsive character and he's got repulsive yeah. ideas. Mm-hmm. He wants to, you know, to get rid of the Sindulas for his own power and greed, not even realizing that the Empire is playing him like, but which they shoot him. Uh, and then to frame basically the Sindulas uh, for an attempted assassination uh, on Orn Frita's life. So then we get this Hera is on the run. Cham has this great spear move. He's super awesome. He's, he's quite the combatant. It's very easy yeah. to tell, Tom, and I think you'll agree with the way the reason Hera has incredible fighting prowess. And determination and grace and grit and tenacity in this really composed package. Her parents are just so great. So it's, it's really cool to see. I like I have Chan was always bugged me because he has been shown to be so abrasive, but we're starting to see why. We haven't seen it all yet, unfortunately, and it's gonna be rough when we do. But I lo- I think it's really cool. So to me, and I know we're wrapping up here, this was definitely a Hera show and I'm great mm-hmm. with that. I love Hera. She's one of my favorite characters in star Wars. I'm still going to hold to my a minus, which is a great, great grade, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to seeing how this ties up, whether it's the next episode or how, how much longer it goes, but Tom or Aaron, any last minute thoughts on this episode? Well, I, I loved it. It, it was, it was great. You know, um, I know at the beginning I said a plus 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 plus, um, but I, I actually overall in reality, real great. I would gave it was an A because it was so good. It was Chopper was in it, Hair was in it, but the the lack of the Bad Batch had me questioning things. The the lack of Clone Force ninety nine, but it was uh, just a great episode. And if IMDb is correct, the next episode will wrap up this story because. Uh, the titles are all listed there and uh, it definitely is. Looks like it might be about Ryloth. So I am looking forward to, to uh, Friday. <laughs> I, I am too. And I love that you mentioned Tom. Um, it was so well put how this is like a bridge between Clone Wars and Revival. I hadn't thought about it like that. That's a great one. Any last minute thoughts on this episode? Yeah, I think, you know, one, one way that I make sense of why the Bad Batch wasn't in here is this is our opportunity to see the impact that they have. And this is an opportunity. First of all, I am I am completely uh, uh, believe now. I, we've suspected it, but I believe now that Sid is working for the good. Um, she's got an abrasive. She's got an abrasive way. She's got an abrasive way about her and doing business. But this is our chance to see the impact that they that they have in delivering and doing the work for Sid and we see both sides and it and it works because we know these characters already we know where these characters are going so i thought it was very well done i look forward to a full episode and going back to regular episodes of bad batch in 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 their full glory but this was a great great connecting piece love it love it yeah it, it's a one. great Go ahead, Aaron. Just one thing I wanted to build off of what he said with it being a bridge between Clone Wars, Rebels, and everything. This episode really was that bridge. And not just in the storytelling and everything, but we got to physically see it in the animation. Because we saw we opened up with the scene uh, at the city, which is the same city we saw in Clone Wars with the bridge that we saw Mace Windu uh, 
try to take uh, take the city when they were mm-hmm. when Wat Tambor was stealing the Ark of the Covenant. And then we see the Hera homestead from Rebels. So we got these two two different oh. locations from two different shows that had major significance in the same episode. To me, that was the physical representation of that bridge. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> As we near the end of the show today, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi and have a cup of coffee tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. We have a lot of fun, and you'll make some new friends, as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, go to www.cwkalliance.com and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, but you also get access to CWK Pour Over, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos and so much more if you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air feel free to email me at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com and i'll share them on the show you can also connect with me on twitter at mr zare m-r-z-e-h-r or on instagram at danzare c-w-k there are also a lot more ways to connect with me and coffee with kenobi on social media follow us on twitter and instagram give us a like on facebook at facebook.com slash coffee with kenobi Check us out on Pinterest or subscribe to our Coffee with Kenobi YouTube channel. On our YouTube channel, you can find Facebook Live video, different interviews throughout the years, highlights of video coverage throughout the Coffee with Kenobi history, and the audio podcast itself. You can order my book, The Star Wars Book, which I co-wrote with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Books A Million, Walmart, or anywhere books are sold. You can also find my writing on Coffee with Kenobi's website, as well as StarWars.com, where I am an official blogger there, and on IGN, where I contribute occasionally to articles about Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. If you are considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out DanzyMedia.com and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. I want to inspire you to be inspired so you can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks, as always, to our Coffee with Kenobi sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet you want to go on your vacation. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash Mouse Fan Travel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word, and I can't thank you enough for your help 
for your support and your friendship. I love so much being a part of this wonderful Star Wars community, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do for me and Coffee with Kenobi. Well, I, I don't That's really cool. think we could end the episode any better than that. Wonderful. Well, Aaron, uh, thank you so much, as always, for coming back to Coffee with Kenobi. You know you're always welcome to share a cup of coffee with us. Please let everybody know about Star Wars Reactions and where they can reach out to you, hear the show, and follow you on social media. Oh, thanks. Well, it's always great to come home to coffee with Kenobi. This is this is like a like my home. Uh, so, if you want to follow us on Star Wars Reactions, uh, we do a Star Wars podcast. Star Wars Reactions cover everything uh, Star Wars. Um, uh, me and, of course, my co-host David, who was on a previous episode last week. Uh, you can find us uh, on Facebook and on Instagram, SW Reactions, Twitter, SW Reactions Pod. Uh, or you can look me up. Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter, uh, TA Harris 121079. Or, of course, you can always email me, Aaron, at StarWarsReactions.com. Perfect. And, Tom, let everybody know about where they can find you and your great work. Sure. Uh, well, they can catch uh, you, Corey Club, and me on uh, C- uh, CWK Pour Over, our Patreon show. And then uh, we're all guest guest hosts. No, we're all co-hosts <laughs> of that. Um, and then uh, you can find me on Twitter at DraftLine and uh, catch some of my writing on Star Wars and many, many other topics on my blog, Seeking Positivity in the Galaxy. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. 